Good morning. How are we going this morning? It's good. So if you have your Bibles, open up to Revelation. So we're going to be looking at Revelation chapter 3. It will be on the screen, but it's cool to have your Bibles as well. Um, and I've said this before, like we do with our youth Bible study, if you've got a pen or a pencil, you are allowed to underline stuff in your Bible. Okay, It's not, not irreligious or anything. You can do that if something sticks out or God's speaking to you about something. It's okay to do that. But so we're looking... So in Revelation, at the chapters 2 and 3, there are seven... Uh, letters or words to churches in Asia, which Jesus gave to John to then send out the whole book of Revelation to. So we're looking at the seventh of these today, which is to the church in Laodicea. So we'll read through that, and then um, there's some cool stuff about this, which I only found out yesterday, um, that actually applies to what God is saying to them in this. So this is what it says from verse 14. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So, because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, so that you can become rich, and white clothes to wear, so that you can cover your shameful nakedness, and salve to put on your eyes, so that you can see. Those whom I love are rebuke and discipline, so be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So there's a bit in that, um, and there's a lot of context and a lot of history that goes into there, which um, I've been able to do some research on this week and found out some stuff, which has completely opened my eyes to exactly what this looks like. And I've heard some message on it before, but never anything um, like that. But to start with, we need to understand a little bit about this place called Laodicea. So the only other time it's actually mentioned in the Bible is in Paul's letter to the Colossians. So geographically, um, they were only about 15 kilometers apart. Laodicea was to the west, I think it was, of Colossae. And all we really know about that is that the Christians in Laodicea were known to Paul and that he actually wrote a letter to them as well. Now, it's not in what we have in these 66 books of the Bible, but he wrote a letter to them as well. And we know that he told the Colossians and the Laodiceans to switch letters. So after they've read them to their own church, then switch and read the others as well. So they're about, they're about 15 kilometers west of Colossae and 10 kilometers south of a place called Hierapolis. In Laodicea, there was a lot of pagan worship, especially of Zeus, the Greek god. Um, that was very prominent there. But in the region, in the area, there was also a significant amount of Jews, which actually created a problem for Paul and his companions when they were traveling through trying to convert people at the start. But the fact that they were there actually gave a really good foundation for Christianity to start there. And they were located on a major trade route connected to all the other important cities. So they were well-known and they were well-connected and they were pretty well off in a lot of ways. As we go through, there's a lot more historical information which actually applies to what Jesus says to them. But we'll get to that when we get there. But we've got to remember that this is something which we need to be able to take something out of as well. 
It was originally written to them. But God's word is timeless. And what he wants to say to everyone is all in there. So let's look at that as we um, go through this and see what it is that God is trying to say and show us. So with Revelation chapter 3, so a couple of things to note about um, these words in Revelation. So all the seven churches that are mentioned, they all got the book of what we have as Revelation. It, they didn't just get their own little snippet. They all got the whole book. The whole of Revelation was written to all these churches and all these places. And in each of them, it starts with a picture of who Jesus is relevant to what he says to them. And it all looks at different aspects of who he is. And each of these finishes with some kind of reward for those who are victorious in staying faithful to Jesus. And again, which is relevant to what he says to them in that. And all of them, apart from this one, actually have something that Jesus commends them for. Some of them have big issues to fix, but they've always got something which Jesus can say, this is still good in what you're doing or who you are. But this one doesn't have that. It's only stuff to fix up. But the need, as we're going to see, is always, the way to fix it is always repentance. It's always fixing their eyes and our eyes back on who Jesus is, which is why it starts with a picture of who he is. So we can actually fix our eyes on that and know him. He is always the answer. And that's what we're going to see in this too. So let's go through this. So in verse 14, the picture of Jesus that we get. So it says, these are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. There's a few different parts to who he is here. So when it says he is the Amen, it means that God's work and God's promises are accomplished through and because of Jesus. Nothing else outside of him is actually adequate to solve anything. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul said, for no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. God's plan, it was fully accomplished in Jesus when he came to earth, when he, the ministry that he had when he lived here, and when he was died and rose again. So everything stems on that. All of Christianity stems on that. If you take the Jesus' death and resurrection out, we're not left with anything. So it all finds its accomplishment and fulfillment in Jesus. And Jesus is a faithful and true witness. His opinion is what matters, not anyone else's. As we will see, the people in Laodicea, they had this idea and perception about who they were and how they were going. But in actual fact, Jesus went, you it's completely the opposite of what you're thinking. There was the, their perception and then the reality, reality that he pointed out to them. And then the ruler of God's creation. Ruler can also mean first. And Jesus himself says that he is the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And he has the authority. In Colossians chapter 1, Paul says, He is before all things. And in him, all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. So the picture here of Jesus that we get is that he's the one with authority, who speaks the truth, and who through everything is accomplished. Everything that God's trying to do in us and through us and with us it is accomplished in actually us becoming more like Jesus. He is the one we need to be listening to. In youth group, we've been talking, looking at the idea of identity. And on a Friday just, um, just gone, we looked at the fact that there are so many things that our identity can be in, whether it's things we're good at or what our achievements are or what other people say about us. But what actually matters is who does Jesus say that I am? Who am I to him? And when we have that sorted in our mind, everything else flows on from that. But 
matters. It's his opinion that matters. It's what he says that matters. Now, if what other people say agree with that, awesome. But if not, then there's a decision to go, am I going to go with what God's saying or am I going to go with what other people are saying or what, even what I'm thinking about myself? So that's who Jesus is and that's who he's being conveyed to the people at Laodicea. The one with authority, the one who should be listened to and the one who speaks the truth. Then this is what he says, verses 15 to 16. I know your deeds that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. How's that for a reality check? So Laodicea was extremely wealthy and they were famous for a few things in the ancient world. But one thing that went against them was that they didn't have their own water supply. So Colossae and the mountain region, which is kind of to the east of them, they had fresh cold water to use for things, whether it was drinking or whatever else they used it for. And as I mentioned, so the other place that they are near was called Hierapolis. They had hot water springs there as their water supply, which can be used for so many things. But Laodicea didn't have that. So they had to pipe it in from outside, which is fine. But by the time it got there, you can guess what temperature it was. Lukewarm. Wasn't cut wasn't hot, wasn't cold, wasn't hot. It was lukewarm, which wasn't good for anything and wasn't useful for anything. And not very appetizing either. You could reheat it, I guess, but didn't get there in a good condition. And this was the charge that Jesus is putting against them. The state you're in, you're not actually good for anything. You don't look good, you don't feel good, you don't taste good. There had to be a change in them. And the other thing with Laodicea here about not having their own water, water supply was that because it was getting piped in, they were especially vulnerable to enemy attacks. Because all they would have to do is block that and wait them out. So they were very accommodating if there was an enemy around trying to come in. They had to keep everyone on their good side. Otherwise, they were quite vulnerable to that. But that's the charge against them. You're not actually good for anything right now. You're disgusting. You're not doing your job. You're not bringing life. You're not refreshing where you are. And this is why. So in verses 17 to 18, you say, I am rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you can become rich and white clothes to wear so that you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so that you can see. There was three specific things which Laodicea was very well known for. And Jesus actually refers to those things here. They were wealthy and they were actually a banking center for the ancient world, for their area. They had money coming in and going out all the time. They even had their own coins um, made there where other places didn't. They had a lot of money coming and going and because of that, they were very self-sufficient as a place. There's even a story where they were in AD 60, AD, not 18, AD 60, there was an earthquake which wrecked a whole heap of the places there. And so the emperor would give financial help to all of them to rebuild and get fixed up. But Laodicea actually refused the help and went, we got enough, we don't need you, we'll do it on our own. And they did. They funded everything that they needed for themselves. So when Jesus says to them, you say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing, they had built this idea that they didn't need any help, that they didn't need anything because they already were sorted. They were already all good because of what they had, because they were wealthy. And he says to them, well, you're actually poor. You're actually poor. You think you're wealthy and that you're sorted and you're 
you've got what you need, but you don't. You're the opposite of that. Physically, you've got it, but spiritually, you don't. And Jesus was big when he was having his ministry. He was really big on what we call laying up treasures in heaven. He told many parables and even just bluntly told people, you're storing up for yourself things here, but you've actually got no thought or consideration for the life that comes after, for the life that actually means something. And so they, physically, these guys were fine. But Jesus says to them, you know, if you want to talk about buying stuff, we'll get this. Buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you can become rich. In 1 Peter, we read about the faith of the Christians being refined and worth more than gold. Because that's because it is. Because at the end of the day, it's our faith in God and in the saving work of Jesus that actually means something and makes a difference. It's not the money we have. That faith is worth more than every, any penny and every penny we could ever make. That's, not, that's nothing against having money. Money is nice. But if that is coming ahead of our faith, and if that is taking priority over our faith, and if that is what we're relying on more than God, then that's when it's become a problem. That's what he's pointing out to these guys here. So the second thing that they were known for was they actually had a really good textile and clothing production going on. And even uh, today, from what I read in modern Turkey, there's still some pretty good clothing production there. And specifically, there was a certain type of black wool that was very sought after. They had the good garments, the good clothes. And that's probably how they made half their money too. But they were going good in that. They had all the coverings you could want. And yet, one of the other things Jesus puts his finger on, he says, well, you're actually naked. So after the gold refined in the fire to become rich, he says, get from me white clothes to wear so that you can cover your shameful nakedness. He's saying, yes, you've, you've got these lovely black garments that you're known for. You're famous for that. That's great. But spiritually, you've got nothing on you. Spiritually, buy these white clothes from me so you can cover yourself. If you remember way back in the Garden of Eden, after Adam and Eve ate the fruit, they realized that they were naked and they were ashamed. That was physically, but that is actually a picture of what these, Jesus is saying these guys are spiritually. You're not clothed with anything. There's nothing there. And throughout the letters that Paul writes in Ephesians and Colossians and these ones, he says, he talks about putting on and putting off things. Clothe yourselves with compassion, he says. Tie it all together with love. See, it's the intangible virtues that come with following Christ that are actually what God is looking at. He doesn't look at the outward appearance. He looks at the heart. And on the outside, these guys in Laodicea, they were clothed very well with things that were very sought after. But inside, they had nothing on. So Jesus is saying, buy from me what I'm offering. Jesus told a parable. There's kind of two parts to it. And the king has this big banquet set up, this big party, this feast. And he invites many people to come along and they all make excuses and go, oh, I can't do it for this reason. I've just got some more sheep. I can't come. All these reasons. And so all his servants come back and report that to him. He says, well, this place is going to be full one way or the other. So go out find everyone on every street corner and invite them all in. And so they do, and the place is filled. Then the master of the house comes along, and there's one guy there who's not wearing the right clothes. And he gets sent out, not to come in again. And 
this is what Jesus is saying. Spiritually, you haven't got the right clothes on. You look great on the outside, but on the inside, you don't. And this comes back to what he says. If you don't change, you're going to stay lukewarm and I'm going to spit you out. I'm going to cast you out. You're done. He's saying, buy from me white clothes to wear so that you can cover your shameful nakedness. Now, the third thing that Laodicea was famous for They were a hub for medical achievements. They had their own medical college thing there for the ancient world. That one of their most prominent guys who come out of there, his name was Demosthenes Philolethes. I'm going to pretend I said that right. Say it confidently, everyone thinks you know what you're talking about. So he came out of there and guess what? He was an eye doctor. And They were well known for producing a certain powder that they only did in Laodicea that was was known and used for treating eye diseases. And so when Jesus says that they're blind, he then says, buy from me a salve to put on your eyes so that you can see. They were well known for having these treatments for for people's eyes to help people physically see when they couldn't. But he's saying, you might be doing that on the outside, but the inside you cannot see a thing. And what is that down to? Well, who knows? I think pride's probably the biggest one for those. Because when we start thinking about ourselves and thinking that we've got this sorted, we lose our sight of God and our need for him. And then everything else starts not working. And on the outside, we can still be doing the things that we know we should. We can still be coming to church or going to Bible studies or youth group or doing good things for people. But why are we doing them? Are we doing them because we know we should or because that's what we've always done or I saw someone else who's a really nice person, they did it, so I'm going to do it too. They're not necessarily bad reasons. But at the end of the day, are we doing something to follow Christ? Or are we doing it just to do it? We can turn up to church as much as we like, but if we're not actually following God while we're doing it, then it's not going to save you. He says, buy from me a salve to put on your eyes so that you won't be spiritually blind anymore, so that you can see. In Acts 26, Paul is talking about how Jesus came to him and what he said to him when he converted him. And then Paul says that um, Jesus, Jesus said to him, I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I'm sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. That's what having our eyes opened is. The thing is, we're foolish to think that even as Christians that we can't get blinded or lose sight simply because we are Christian. Satan was one of the high up angels and yet still got blinded so much by his own pride. Sorry, he was Lucifer then, and then he ended up becoming, getting cast down and becoming Satan. We are blind when we see something above Jesus. As we're going to see, the answer is always getting our eyes back onto him, looking back at him again. No matter what the predicament, that option is always there. So the funny thing is, their wealth, their clothing production, their medical prowess, this gave the people in Laodicea a sense of self-sufficiency, that they were fine all on their own. But they 
had a constant reminder in their lack of their own water supply that they weren't actually that. And so Jesus used all of these things to point out to them that spiritually, because they think they are fine, because they think they're self-sufficient, they've actually become like their water. Lukewarm and disgusting. They they know what he's talking about. He's pointing out to them that because you're starting to see yourself as higher than needing Jesus, you've become like your disgust in water and you're of no use. But there is good news and he gives it to them here in verse 19. Those whom I love are rebuke and discipline. This is the good news. There is still hope. So even though in this part, to this church, unlike the others, there was nothing that Jesus could commend about them, he hasn't knocked them off yet. They are still one of the seven golden lampstands. They are still there. He hasn't got rid of them. He said, I'm going to spit you out if you're like this. But here now there is opportunity to change. It says, those whom I love are rebuke and discipline. In Hebrews chapter 12, so the writer says this, Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of spirits and live? They disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good, in order that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Now this is the hope that we all have. While we are still here and breathing, we have a chance. But we need to be willing to receive the correction that Jesus is offering. But that's the good news. We're not done with yet. There may be things that we need to fix up, which, as we're about to see, it all comes back to getting back to Jesus. There may be things to fix up. There may be nothing good going for us at all, but we're still here, so there's still a chance to change and be turned around. Whatever the situation, keeping our eyes on Jesus or getting our eyes back onto him is the answer. And that's what he says, so be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with them and they with me. And you'll notice that he gives this action to individuals to do, not the group. If anyone hears my voice, not if any church, not if half the church or the church members, if anyone hears my voice and opens the door. I will come in and eat with them and they with me. And this is what has to happen. He is there. He is waiting. He's not playing hide and seek. Jesus doesn't do that. And he is there waiting for you if you have not yet opened the door. Or if you've had it open and you've closed it and gone, okay, thanks for everything you've done so far, but I'll take it from here. Because we can do that too. When we open the door, Jesus isn't going to be angry. He's not going to be like, far out. Why didn't you do this sooner? Man, I've been waiting here for 50 years. I don't know, five, whatever it is for you. I've been waiting here for that long. You should have opened it sooner. What are you doing? I don't believe that's what it's going to be. It's going to be open arms. I'm glad to see you. We might be kicking ourselves going, man, I should have done this sooner. But he's waiting there with open arms to enter in. There'll be love and there'll be peace. So in Luke chapter 10, there's um, the story when Jesus sends out his 72 or 70, depending on what um, version you read. But what he says, he sent them out to preach the gospel. And what he says to them is, when you enter a house, first say, peace to this house. If someone who promotes peace is there, your peace will rest on them. If not, it will return to you. 
Stay there, eating and drinking whatever they give you, for the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. When you enter a town and are welcomed, eat what is offered to you. Heal those who are ill and tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you. But this is also, that was what he told them then when they were going, when he sent them out. But this is also the promise which we see in Revelation 3.20. When we open the door to him, he will come in and he will stay. He will, it says, he will eat, I will eat with them and they with me. He will cleanse and heal what we give him. And with him there, the kingdom of God will be near us because of him. Just as he was sending out his disciples and the other preachers to do that. It's the same promise which we see here of when he enters into our lives. In John chapter 14, verse 23, Jesus is talking to his disciples and he says, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. We will be at home with Jesus. And that is the change that has to happen. That is the change that will stop us being lukewarm. That will actually make us as individual Christians, but then when that happens for everyone in the church, what's that church going to be like? There's going to be things happening. There's going to be transformation happening. He is going to use us. But it has to start with us being willing to go, I am poor, I am blind, I am naked. Jesus, I need you to fix this. I need you to give me your gold. I need you to give me something to put in my eyes so I can see. I need you to clothe me. So all those are just, they're, they're metaphors and analogies, but what they're all pointing to is us saying, Jesus, I need you more than anything. That's the key message. These guys have lost their need for Jesus. And if you feel like that's you, if you feel like you're actually relying on something else apart from him or more than him, or even on the same level as you're relying on him, well, do something about that. It might be getting rid of something. It might be changing how your day looks. I don't know. But that's what it has to be. It has to be acknowledging that he is the one we need in everything. Now, for those who don't know, I've just um, started a new job. So I was chappy at CCC. I've now moved from there and I'm working with Anglicare doing the youth resi work. Um, same as what Monique's been doing for a year and a half or something like that. And I did all my induction and then normally you're meant to do shadow shifts after that to help prepare you. So you go into the homes but you're there as an extra to the people who are already on, on shift there. Well, on Monday I got a message from the Sarah, the coordinator, and she has said, hey, so, I know you're meant to be doing shadow shifts. Could you just, like, jump in the deep end for me? And so I did. I'm like, sure, why not? But, man, the, s the stories of well, all of these kids that are living in those homes, I haven't experienced what they've experienced. A lot of us haven't. And I'm going in, like, there are no magic words to make things better. The key thing that, I mean, it's drummed into us in our training and everything as well, is that these kids need someone to love them and care for them and nurture them more than anything else. Which, no, that's it. And that's what we should be called to do for each other as Christians anyway. But that's going to get tested when they're, swearing in your face right up in you or they disappear for hours at a time without telling you where they are at midnight and then come home 
half stoned, <laughs> needing something to eat. I'm like, things that they say, the things that they come out with, you know, there's no quick fix. And I'm just praying the whole time I'm there, like, God, what do these kids need? They, they need love. And, and I can offer that in certain ways, and that's for sure. But, and I can see that they, they need God's love. But this is also a place where we're not really meant to openly just put that out there as well. So I'm going, I, God, I need your help to be able to show this to these kids without being able to actually say anything. I don't know how to do that on my own because my love is not enough. His is, but I need him to work through me. And this is actually made, this is making me pray even more than I already was. Just on the go all the time. But I could come in here going, I've been working with teenagers for a decade now, you know, I know how to do this, she'll be right. But if I do that, things aren't going to go as good. And I'm praying, God, I need you to do something with this because I cannot meet this on my own. Then we come to verse 21. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Another verse which came to mind was Ephesians chapter 2, verses 6 to 7. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. I don't know what this is going to look like. I don't know exactly how it's going to play out, but it's a promise from Jesus for those who overcome. And overcoming, being victorious, comes through repenting and staying faithful to him. It's not what I can personally overcome. It's relying on Jesus who's already overcome it all and letting him be the witness between me and God so that on the judgment day, I don't have to stand on my own. I've actually got him with me. That's the hope and the promise that this provides. And it's there for everyone who decides that we can't rely on ourselves. Verse 22. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. I could get up and get up here and preach till I'm blue in the face, but that's not going to change anything if you're not the one actually listening to God. It may be through something I said; it may not, and that's okay. But as um, Pastor Rob shared last week, as a committed Christian, we are supposed to have an ear, or probably both ears, attuned to the Holy Spirit and what he is saying. And if we're not listening, then lukewarm is what we're going to be. If we're not listening, then nothing is going to change. And if we're not listening, it shows that we're not relying on him. So it has to be the first step that we all take is listening for what God is saying. That could be through something said this morning. More likely, it's something God's saying to you during the week. But it actually takes spending time with him and being open to that. Actually having that communication through prayer with him. Actually opening our Bibles and reading it with the mindset of, God, I want you to say something. I need you to say something to me. So let's commit to that. That is where it all starts. The, Laodicean, the people in Laodicea had switched themselves off to an extent and stopped listening because they decided they didn't need to rely on God. I want to encourage you, if you're already doing that, I know a lot of you are, keep doing that. There will be times when it doesn't work out, when it doesn't feel like it works out. 
but that's okay. It doesn't mean it's wrong. So I'm going to invite the band to come back up. But I want, I want this to be the commitment that we make this week and afterwards is are we listening and are we following and are we relying on God? Or are we seeking simply to try and make it our way in our strength on our own? God, you, you are absolutely amazing. And you are, no one and nothing else can compare to you. And we acknowledge that, we say it, we sing it. But we can still try and rely on ourselves, on our own strength and giftings and experience. And Lord, if this is what we are doing, we repent of that. We ask for your forgiveness and we thank you for your grace. That we still have a chance to open the door. For those who are struggling today, whether as a result of following you or of not following you, Lord, help them to fix their eyes on you. Through the pain, through the struggle, whether it's for the first time or something we've got to come back to, we want to fix our eyes on you to rely on you because we can't do this any other way. We thank you for your word. We thank you that you are there and available to us every second of every day. We want to listen to you. In Jesus' name.